Hey, everybody, welcome to episode number 52 of the Debt Free Dad podcast. You know, there are many myths about money and debt, and many of these myths are keeping people stuck. So today we're going to be sharing the top eight myths, at least in our opinion, and how to overcome them. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Debt Free Dad podcast, where we're helping normal, everyday people learn how to save money and kick debt so they can live a happier and stress-free life. Now here's your host, Debt-Free Dad, Brad Nelson. Hey, 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 how's everyone doing today? You can find me on Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Just search Brad Nelson, Debt-Free Dad, and we would love to connect with you on one of those social platforms. So guys, today we're going to be taking some time out of the show to talk a little bit about some of the most common myths about money and debt. And, you know, we talk a lot about on this show about how marketing and, and the messages that are being uh, advertised and pushed out there, whether they're from marketers or even your friends and family, uh, these things have become known as myths. And uh, we've also done an episode a while back ago. I, I forget what episode number this was, but it was uh, talking about uh, the truthiness of money and debt, which was another great episode similar to this, which if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and check that out. I want to say that was done in like March or April of uh, 2020, but uh, lots of great stuff that was shared on that show as well. But uh, today we're going to be talking about these common myths. And guys, as you guys read through this list, um, were these you you guys in the past, do you think? (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's just, it's what's, it's what's, uh, I mean, as you go through these myths, I mean, that's financial industry is the one who's been teaching you, you know, if you're, or, or parents who probably learned from the financial industry, what they taught you. So, um, it's just, you know, they, I mean, the reality is, is what we learn or what we think we know has really been taught to us by somebody and it's not, there's not actual true. Right. And the first one, I'm going to kick it off with one of the best ones out there. Uh, we hear this one quite a bit. Budgets are only for broke people or penny pinchers. <laughs> <laughs> and here, but here's the thing. Here's what I think has happened. And maybe you guys have noticed this too, but have you guys made the connection that when you hear the word budget in the marketplace, it usually means the cheap and inexpensive thing, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Like, but just because I'm on a budget doesn't mean I'm going to be cheap and inexpensive about it. <laughs> but they've, they've made that connection, right? Like they say, are you looking for a budget vacation or a luxury vacation? Well, what's the difference? They're both going to be in my budget, right? <laughs> but you Maybe. hear it. You hear if that. If you're doing it right, they're going to be in your budget. <laughs> if you're doing it right. Yeah, that is key. That is key. You have to have a budget, right? You know, when you say budgets are only for broke people or, or penny pinchers, um, the reality is, is if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you're not doing the right things, you're broke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, that, I mean, that was reality for me. I mean, I thought I was doing okay because I could make all our bills in the month and have 50 bucks left in my checking account. That's kind of broke. I mean, that's not necessarily doing the right stuff. Yeah. Well, and even if like, let's, let, well, let's look at, because sometimes people think the fix is, well, I just got to make more money. Right. And I don't think that one made the cut on here, but that's like another myth. Like if I just make more money, that's going to solve all my problems. Well, not so fast. Check out this statistic. I'm going to share this with you. According to a CNBC article written by Chris Dudley of the Boston Private Wealth, check this out. 60%, 60% of NBA players are broke within five years of leaving the league. Five years. And 78% of NFL players experience financial distress after only two years of losing their NFL salary and leaving the league. That is crazy. These, I mean, these are professional athletes. These are people making more money than most of us will ever see in our entire lifetime. And they're still not getting it right, right? So it's it's not the amount of money you make. It's what you do with the money that make that you make matters. And, and if you make money, it's just simple. You need to have a budget. Uh, in fact, I had a financial coach, a colleague of mine that I was a part of a mastermind group when I first started my coaching business. She worked out in the Los Angeles area and she was a financial coach and worked with people who made seven figures. Like we're talking big money. But she's like, Brad, you wouldn't believe that these people are are just as as broke as people who are making 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a year. She's like, yeah, sure they have bigger houses and nicer cars and they have the country club memberships and all of that stuff. But she said at the end of the day, 
they're not in any better of a place than say someone who's just making a normal salary because they're not saving and they're spending way more than they're making. So let's just be real. Let's just bust this myth right now. If you make money, you need to have a budget. And the sooner that you realize that, the better off that you're going to be. The next one is, and this is a common one, especially as people get first get started. But if I can only save a little bit, it's not worth it or it doesn't count. In fact, we've created this rule in Roots Personal Finance. Like there is no, it's only. I saved, but it was only, <laughs> right? We don't have that rule. We have, we have that rule. Like you can't say those words. We celebrate every amount of savings. I don't care if it was $5. We are celebrating because we're all about creating the habit of saving. But small amounts are worth it. Yeah. And they, they add up and you'd be surprised how quickly they add up or where you're going to find them. And if you're just like, eh, it's not really worth it. I'm just going to go ahead and go get this fast food and just spend it instead of saving it. it you, it'll never add up. So you may as well, I don't know. You just, <laughs> you got nowhere to go from there. Yeah. And I think a lot of people suffer by comparison, unfortunately, like, you know, you can't look at your situation and then look at another situation and if they like, we just share, you know, we share celebrations at the end of these shows. Some people pay off a large amount of money. You can't take your situation and look at theirs and compare it. You just have to focus on your own situation and what you're able to do and accomplish and celebrate that. But I think the world we live in, is just that social media, that influence, that they're doing this. So I should be able to do that kind of feeling. And you just, you kind of internalize that and you got to push that away and just focus on what you're trying to do. Yep. Small amounts matter in both ways, saving and spending. Because how many of us have fallen for, well, it's only five bucks. What's five bucks? And how many? What's, what's nine ninety nine a month? Who cares? <laughs> Let's just keep paying it. I mean, how many of us, I mean, how, 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 how many thousands of dollars have we wasted by saying, well, it's only five bucks, right? And it's mm -hmm. the same thing with saving. Just because it's only $5 doesn't mean it doesn't count. It counts. It all counts. Every dollar matters, right? The next one is uh, the credit score. The credit score is... The most important thing, all right? And we have a whole show on this, so we're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on this topic. <laughs> and we've, we've said this before. These are like fighting words in the financial world. Like people are just hell-bent on credit scores. And, and, and I get it. It's what we've been fed. It's what we've been taught. It's what a lot of people know. But I'm here to tell you that it is not the most important thing. But it, it is mind-blowing to me how many people join our, our free Facebook group or how many people uh, who will join our free workshops or, or just in general, people will talk to me just because I know I'm a financial coach. And it's amazing to me how many people will ask how to build their credit versus how can I save more money to build an emergency fund? How can I save more money in retirement and invest my money the smart way? How can I, how can I grow my net worth, right? Like those, the, the questions that actually matter, right? But what most people are concerned about is because it's been spoon fed to them over and over and over and over again by marketing and advertising in the financial industry and our parents and our friends and our family is, well, you got to have good credit. Well, you can have good credit, but it, I just want to be clear. It's not the most important part of your financial life. It's just not. It's very low on the totem pole, at least in my opinion. The only reason to me that you need a good credit score is if your intent is to continue to use debt. If your plan is to be in debt, then yes, having a credit score is going to help you get lower interest rates so you can borrow more money and be more in debt. That's the whole purpose of the credit score. The higher it is, if you don't plan to have any debt, it really doesn't matter because you're not borrowing money. So you don't need the credit score to get approved for anything. Cause I go to the store and I buy the couch I want with cash. I don't have to worry about getting the store credit card and getting 0% for 12 months to pay it off. So if your plan is to continue to use debt, by all means, the credit score is important. I agree. Right. But, but we don't want you to use debt. You don't want to continue to use debt. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's fair to say, like, I mean, if you, if you have a goal to have a good credit score, I, I don't think that there is anything wrong with that. I really don't. What I have an issue with is the mindset that the credit score is, is this score of how well you're doing financially. And it's, and it's just right. the, it's the last thing that's really scoring you how you're doing financially. It's, it's actually just scoring you on how well you make payments. That's all it is. It's it's just the financial industry's way to saying how good of a customer are you to and how reliable are you to pay this money back that we're going to give you. Uh, but it's not scoring you on your ability to save, your ability to budget, your ability to invest and and grow wealth and be financially smart. It's it's not scoring you on any of those things. So just keep that in mind. Like 
If you want to have a good credit score, that's fine. But it's just it's just not the most important thing on the list that most people should be concerned about. In fact, if most people concern themselves with more of, hey, I need to build an emergency fund, I need to pay off more debt, uh, I need to get myself to the point where I'm not stressed out all the time. Like if they focus on those things, it'd be amazed at how most of the financial problems that most people are feeling wouldn't even be there. And they probably would have a good credit, a credit score at the same time because they got a plan, they got a budget, they're making their payments on time. So when you get your money in, in a good spot, your, your, your credit score naturally improves over time because you are making your payments on time. You are reducing debt. Like those are all good things that are going to help you in the wrong, long run, but it is not the most important thing. All right. Next one, we've covered this one, a serious episode too, is I need a reliable, safe, and nice vehicle. So I'm going to go get myself a uh, brand new car, right? And uh, this one is crushing for most people's <laughs> financial lives. It really, really is. And I know that this country, and I, Amber, I don't know how candid it is, but like it, we are all about just the new cars. Like it's People just buy new cars like left and right. It's crazy. And People right now are going into dealerships here, and I'm sure it's the same out there with our, like, you know, those long payments plans for their car, but then they're going in and they're trading them in. So now they're like adding that on to the new car payment yep. plan. And it's just going years and years and years. And they're going under for these cars because they got to have the newer and the best. Yeah. It's, and, well, it's the depreciation there. It's, it's a killer. Oh, it's crazy. Well, and it's not just the depreciation. It's the payment itself. I mean, right now the average car payment is $550 a month. And if you guys notice when you guys watch the holiday ads and you probably still see them here in January, but uh, you know, you see these financing deals, 84 months, seven years, seven years of 550 plus dollar car payment. I, I can't even, I can't even fathom that. Like that stresses me out so much just <laughs> thinking about doing that for seven years. But again, these things, when I work, when I work with people and I look at people's budgets and you might, and you might be wondering like, well, where is this all coming from? Well, one, I did it in my own life, but two, I've worked with so many people and it's like these car payments, especially if people are married and they've got two of them are just crushing people's finances and their ability to save, their ability to save for investing, their ability just to get out of debt. Like it's keeping them stuck. And I think for the middle class, I think, you know, as these cars get more and more expensive, I think it's only going to get worse. I really do because income is not increasing as fast as these new car prices are, at least in my opinion. Well, it's starting to trickle down to used cars. You know, I mean, I bought cars for my kids and I mean, I, we, purchased a car for my son, I don't know, five years ago. And I thought we got a pretty good deal. And we just, we've been, we looked for one for my, my youngest, who's going to be turning 16. And I just about fell over. I mean, the car payment, the used car prices have gone crazy. Um, so it, I mean, and, and it's, so yeah, I mean, I, I oh, a car, I mean, car, I love cars. I still like cars. I mean, I can't help it, but, um, but yeah, it, it sunk us for years and we did the same thing. Amber, um, bought, bought cars, paid on them for a while, traded them in, rolled over the negative equity into the other car. I mean, it's hard to get out from under that if that's the way you're doing it. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you know, you're a family and you've got two car payments, you know, like maybe consider like, let's just get rid of one. Can we get rid of one car payment at least? Or, or, you know, if you're getting ready to get yourself into another vehicle, like what's the best way that you can reduce uh, the liability on a monthly basis on your budget? Like, do you need a brand new car? Can you go used? Even if you've got to use debt, like, Let's just think different a little bit about this and see if there's a way that you can reduce that monthly payment and reduce the monthly uh, cash flow stress that's happening on your budget. All right, we're going to come back. We're going to share a few extra tips here before uh, we go into a celebration. Stay tuned. Hey, if you love planners, this is for you. But do you know why planners frustrate me? Because they only really get it half right. Now, sure, they're really good and fancy about helping you manage your time, which is really important, obviously. That's what a planner's for. But where they get it wrong is money, the second most valuable resource in our lives. Most planners don't include any financial planning, things like you know, keeping track of paydays, bills, due dates, spending, yearly expenses, budgets, cash flow planning, debt elimination plans, and goal planning, right? None of that stuff. That's a real pain. And then what? Then you got to create your own and some silly binder, right? And who has time for all of that stuff? So instead, what happens? Nothing, right? A lot of people tend to ignore their finances even more and things only get worse. Well, that all ends today because I am so excited to announce and release my brand new, totally awesome debt freedom planner. This thing's awesome, by the way. Now, before you say, Brad, 
I've already got a planner. This is not an ordinary day planner. This is the Debt Freedom Planner, which is a companion tool that works with your day planner, and it's built to help you manage your money, pay off more debt, and melt away financial stress. And, and I believe this is the tool that a lot of people who wanna take control of their finances have been waiting for. So head on over to therealdebtfreedad.com, click on the Debt Freedom Planner in the menu to get access to your planner today. Hey guys, we are back. We are talking about eight myths about money and debt that will likely keep you stuck. And the next myth is I'm young and I have plenty of time to get out of debt and start saving. <laughs> I thought that in college too. <laughs> oh, this one's painful for me. It really is. Like knowing what I know now about compound interest Ugh. and saving it's like I, I was I, just having that conversation with my husband on uh, Sunday. I was like, imagine we started this like when we were 20. <laughs> seriously. Like this is why like we we talked about, you know, you know, this whole myth of if if you can only save a certain small amount of money, it's not worth it. But it is. So so what we're doing for our kids is we're starting them off like with their own retirement accounts. Uh, that they'll be able to continue as at least that's my goal for them. Really hoping they're going to continue it. <laughs> they better not take that money out, right? <laughs> so what my goal for them though is to take that money and continue to invest just the same amount that we've been putting in. Maybe a little bit more, ideally, obviously, if they can put more in, that'd be great. But just do it until they're 65 years old. And what, we're just putting away $75 a month right now for them. 75 bucks, that's it. And if you look at what compound interest can do from age one, until age 65, if that earned a 10% interest. And again, we don't know what it's going to earn, but even if it's 8%, even if eight to 10%, like they would be a millionaire just on $75 a month for 65 years starting young, right? So that's, that's for me why I'm like always like, I hate looking at what I did in the past because it always, I fear regret like immediately because I, I see the value of, of getting started, saving early, saving often and, um, and, and making it work. Like Warren Buffett, I was just reading about Warren Buffett. He's arguably one of the best investors on the planet, probably the best investor on the planet. And he started investing and saving when he was 10. And he's 10 years old. This guy's worth billions of dollars, right? Um, but it, it just it just goes to show that saving early, saving often, and doing the hard work early, it, it pays off. My oldest uh, is just going to be turning 21 and we had him start his Roth IRA. We've just been, so we've been kind of doing this. We've been into a lot of calculators lately and just kind of showing and kind of using kind of our not great example of why you need to start young. Um, but if you just, we just told him, you know, if you just plan to save, you know, if you could do a hundred dollars, $200 a month, starting at from age 25 to 67, you're going to have like 700, almost $800,000. I said, if you wait until you're my age to start and you save $200 a month, you're going to have about 70 grand. So that 20 years difference makes a huge difference in how much money you can save. If you just start young and put it away and just pretend you don't have it. I'm the same way we have, I, we look at, I mean, we are saving like crazy now, but the amount of money we have to save now to catch up is just, I mean, we, we can't, I mean, I would love to be in a position of where he is now and be able to do the right thing. Um, but yeah, totally agree. Yeah. And I think this, this brings home that point of why this, why this information is so important to teach your kids, why, you know, why you don't want to cripple them with tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, even before they have their first career. You know, it's like, these are all the reasons because if, if they can start out on the right path and be able to start saving and being able to start doing this stuff at an early age, man, it's going to be life changing for them. But yes, you are, you have to start now. If you're young listening to this show, you got to start as soon as you possibly can. The sooner, the better. Next myth, always a good one. Credit cards are for emergencies. Plus I get the points and I get the rewards, right? First and foremost, I'm here to tell you that what the bank is telling you, credit cards are not for emergencies. That is garbage. It's terrible advice. All right. They, they started that whole marketing plan to get you to get that credit card. And, and they sold, they sell you guys on that like fear of, oh, you don't have an emergency fund. You got to have a credit card, right? Because that's going to be there. In fact, I, I have people tell me, well, what do you do in an emergency? Well, I, have, I have cash. I just pay cash. 
well, what if you don't have access to cash? Well, I have a debit card and that works great, right? So, I mean, it's like, it's there. You don't need a credit card as an emergency fund. You should build your own emergency fund and use that for your emergencies. But guys, the points and rewards one is is always a fun, fun conversation. What are your guys' thoughts on the on the points and rewards? I mean, I I like my points, I'm not gonna lie, but I pay my credit card every month. I haven't paid interest in four years. Right. But you learn that by better habits. And and I have no, I have, and some people are like, well, what if I pay it off every month? Well, then keep doing that. Like if it's working for you and you're getting, and you're getting, you're able to take advantage of that, that's great. But for a lot of people, it's not working for them that way. Well, and I think your interest is charging you more than what your points are earning you. Something's wrong. Yeah, correct. <laughs> correct. Something's majorly wrong. In fact, Bankrate came out with a survey in January of 2020, which is just a year ago. And they found that 40% of people who have rewards or or hold a rewards card, they don't pay off their balances every month. 40%. That's a big number, guys. So that means that, you know, four out of 10 people who sign up to get the rewards and the points are are now paying dearly in interest and other fees to, to get those, especially probably because they get the annual credit card fee to have that points card, you know, and all that stuff. So, you know, points and rewards... It's not a fair argument for me because I see too many people getting burned for that. The credit card companies are not in the business of just giving you free stuff because they're nice people. You know, they didn't, they didn't like come up with these rewards because they just want to reward everybody. You know, they came up with them as a way to get you to sign up for the credit card, knowing that there's going to be a large percentage of people who won't pay their balance. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's how it's just a marketing ploy to get you to get the credit card. Um, And, and I, but I totally agree. If you use it and you're, you pay it off and you're responsible and you can do that. Great. I was not that person. We got the Disney rewards card cause it's going to earn us money to take a Disney trip. <laughs> you know how much interest I probably paid them my trip and the interest on the, you know, uh, with all the interest I paid on the card, I probably paid them two trips, three trips. I don't even know how many trips I paid them. And I got like $300 in rewards, you know, <laughs> like, but you're going to just buy the stuff anyway. So you might as well just put it on the card. Right. 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 And, yeah. And get the 0% for 12 months and then, you know, we'll pay it off. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, credit cards, you, you've got to make sure you're playing the game well. And, and that's the other thing with these credit card companies. Isn't it interesting how they do that? So not only do they offer these person rewards to the actual card holders, but that gives them the ability to offer it to more people, which essentially incentivize merchants businesses to sign up to take those credit cards right it's like these credit cards have their the credit card companies have their hands in everything i mean they, they really do it is amazing and quite fascinating how uh they are just a part of everyday life now it's 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 crazy and a last statistic i want to share on these credit card points though is according to business insider 31 percent of people never even redeemed their points 31 percent wow that's a lot. <laughs> That's like three out of 10 people who sign up for this. And they're like, well, I'm just not going to redeem them. Who cares? Right? And, and imagine if those are the ones that you're paying yearly for. Like, what? Right. Right. So here's the thing. Like if you're signing up for credit card rewards, rewards and points, key is pay it off every single month and make sure you use them. Because if you don't, you're losing that game. You are losing that game. Guilty. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was guilty. I'm very disciplined now. <laughs> we, got, we got we got a letter in the mail on the Disney card. Uh, I don't know, it's a number of years ago, and I don't. I usually just rip it all up and I threw it away. But for some reason, I opened it, and it was like, if you don't use this, I don't know. I think I had like sixty some dollars on there by X date. It's gone. Um, totally forgot it was even on there. <laughs> And, and so again, you know, if you want to play the game, you just got to make sure you're you're in it, you're playing it, you're organized, and and your finances are in a good spot. But if you're carrying month to month balances, man, that's that's a game you're losing for sure. So, uh, the next one is I work hard, I deserve this. Now, this is just an attitude problem, <laughs> but but it is real and it is alive and it is well, right? Um, and there is this thought that I deserve this, I work hard, uh, you know, I. I, I should have this brand new truck or I should be able to go on this vacation or I should be able to buy this house and have all the things that go in it because I work hard, right? Man, this is a dangerous statement that's going to put a lot, puts a lot of people into debt and payments. There's no question. This is hard. I mean, we all, 
we all work hard. I mean, I work, I mean, we all do. And I think I, I mean, I use this for a long time. I mean, I still talk myself into stuff or almost talk myself into stuff to this day, you know, oh, you know, you really should get it. You know, Brad, you talked about last year about the whole drone issue. About <laughs> yeah. you, just, you know, you work hard. You should really, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, it's just that you, you get trapped and feeling like, man, what am I doing all this for? I should really do this because, yeah, you know, I, I really do deserve it. I, you know, and you can convince yourself of anything. I know I can. All right. The last one we're going to talk about is I can afford the payments. And again, this all comes back to just where we are as a general society and that everything is sold to us as payments. In fact, this past holiday season, guys, I was online. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people did their online, sh you know, shopping online. And I couldn't believe how many, there's, I mean, almost every one, I think. Every single one of them had kind of, and I'm not going to mention the name of the company, but all of them had a financing option, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't through the company that you were buying it from, they all had, hey, buy this and only pay a low monthly fee of this, right? Almost every purchase did. Did you guys see that too? Oh yeah, uh, tons. And I I mean, I'd love to shop online. So <laughs> I saw it all over. I'm like, wait, how do I get it for that? Oh, it's uh, a payment thing. No, <laughs> it, it's everywhere. And especially with these apps now and, and being able to do these quick payday loans and things that are out. I mean, it is it is scary, dangerous to get yourself into some of this, some of these payments and stuff. So, uh, in a lot of cases, you know, when it comes to these payments, for most people, you're likely paying interest, you're paying fees. It's costing you money. In fact, Amber, we just did a fact or fiction on a Friday not too long ago, and it said that the average person, and if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, it was over six hundred thousand dollars in interest that they would pay in their lifetime. Right? Yeah. Yep. That is unbelievable. $600,000 in interest on debt. Imagine not paying that to the finance companies and the banks. Imagine saving all that interest and compound interest happening. Oh, oh my gosh. Heck, even if you saved half of that, like, you know, you still had a little bit of debt, but maybe, heck, if you just saved half of it, right? Because I got to say, for, for a lot of people, a lot of that debt probably comes from their mortgage, especially if you're on a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Um, or you have a higher interest rate mortgage, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you're paying a lot of interest on a longer mortgage like that. But, um, but still, you add on the cars and the credit cards and all that other stuff, man, that's a lot of interest. That's a lot of money. So this whole myth that, you know, just because you can afford a payment does not mean that you can afford the object, the thing, the thing that you're purchasing. And, and the sooner you get away from that thinking, the better off your finances are going to be. It's almost magical how quickly your finances can, can improve once you just, have this general rule that you follow that if I don't have cash, I can't buy it. And just that little rule can save you so much frustration and stress. The companies too are so good at, I mean, you, like you said, you've seen it all, all these little cards and all these little payments and they make the payment low because it's kind of that death by a thousand cuts. I mean, we fell for it. Buy furniture, five years, only 25 bucks a month. Well, if you do that enough, and you do that enough times on a whole bunch of stuff, suddenly it's not $25 a month. It's 500 or 600 or or $1,000 a month on payments. And it's all these little things that it's, it's just the, the, card com the credit card companies know 50 bucks a month doesn't seem like that much to you. Oh, it's only 50 bucks a month. If they said, hey, minimum payments are 500 a month, people would be like, I'm not buying that. <laughs> right. But, oh, it's 50? <laughs> I can afford 50. Yep. It, it is so true. It is. It is death by a thousand cuts. And it's also what I like to call all those little tiny cuts is death or a uh, minimum payment hell. Minimum payment hell is what a lot of people are in. And I find that a lot, actually, when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with people is that uh, people don't necessarily have a ton of debt. They have a lot of accounts and they have all those little tiny payments that are coming out of it. And before you know it, all their money's gone. They can't make any headway on paying any of it off. So uh, that's a bad plan. So yeah, just stick with the with this whole idea that if, if you don't have cash, you can't afford it. And if you're looking for some more help on your finances, we've got a great winter workshop coming up called Life Without Payments. This is coming up on January 17th through the 20 or through the 22nd. And you can sign up on our website. We're going to be going over all of the steps of the Debt Freedom Success Path on how to change your mindset from these common myths that we just shared and how, a, how to change your habits, your bad habits over into good habits, helping you reach financial freedom over time. You can go over to therealdebtfreedad.com, click on the button right below on the homepage there to get registered for that live workshop that's coming up. And again, that is live and that is done personally with us. And I look forward to seeing you guys there. Hey, hey, what's this I see? I thought this was a party. Let's 
All right, all right. That sound means it's time for the celebrations of the show. And today we're kicking it off with Brandon Belger. I'm really, really excited because we're going to have Brandon on our podcast coming up in February. He's going to come on and share how they've had some such fantastic success since they've joined Roots back in April of 2020. But they put $100 in their emergency fund. They said they also totaled it all up, and we've paid off $1,600 in debt last month. That is awesome. Congratulations to you guys. Lacey Love, huge behavior change accomplished. I forgot my debit card and had to use my credit card to pay for something. It was only $25, but I actually felt irritated that I had to use my card. I immediately paid it off. I used to cringe when I paid with my debit card instead of my credit card in fear of gaining another overdraft fee. Credit card felt like it was not my money that I was spending. That's awesome. See, we talk all about those behavior changes, those habit changes, and uh, that's a great one. Great job, Lacey. Judy Riley, I paid off my smallest credit card. It was a small $155, but it's a win. That is a huge win. Congratulations. Way to go, Judy. Uh, Chasey May, I was able to catch up on all my bills with my paycheck today, and I even paid a little extra on a sum, which is awesome. Great win. Missy Stokes, I was able to put $35 in my emergency fund and ate all my meals at home. That's huge. Awesome. Love that. Mary Southard, I paid $1,030.87 towards debt, $200 to a health account, and $245 to envelopes. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us here today. We love your feedback, and it also helps us grow our YouTube show. So please give us a like or leave us some honest feedback on this video. And if you want the latest from the show, obviously be sure to hit that notification bell and subscribe to our channel. And for the latest resources, or if you want more information on how to kick debt and financial stress, please be sure to check out the links in this video or head over to the real debtfreedad.com. We'll see you guys on an upcoming show. Take care.